Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Embracer Analyst and Investor Call this morning. Uh, my name is Ben May, and I'm an Equities Analyst at Berenberg Bank, and I've been covering Embracer for a number of years now. Um, I've been pleased to have been invited uh, to open up the call this morning on what is an exciting day for an Embracer, uh, with the company announcing eight acquisitions uh, this morning, spanning a number of areas in the gaming market, from mobile businesses to development studios to publishing uh, businesses also. Uh, we've kindly got the management teams from the acquired companies uh, with us today. Uh, but before we hear from the different management teams, um, I will hand over to Lars, who's going to run you through the strategic rationale for the acquisitions completed this morning. And we'll be back at the end of the call, uh, at which point I will host a Q&A. So over to you, Lars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, for uh, being able to join this call uh, with short notice this morning. And uh, hello, everyone, and very welcome to uh, sunny Karlstad here in Sweden. I'm uh, excited and delighted to to finally be able to present uh, eight new uh, acquisitions this morning in our companies and welcome more than 560 new colleagues to the group. Today, uh, uh, we will present uh, Crazy Labs from, from Israel, uh, one of the leading hypercasual uh, mobile publishers. We will present uh, Ghost Ship Games, uh, a well known name uh, from Denmark, uh, the makers behind uh, Deep Rock Galactic. Also from Denmark, we will have uh, Slipgate, uh, Ironworks, and 3D Realms. Uh, further, we will have uh, one of the leading uh, VR uh, developers, Force Field from the Netherlands, uh, and uh, Digix Art from France, one of the leading uh, indie games developers, Star Driven, and uh, Easy Trigger, which is close by here in Sweden, from uh, Trollhättan. And uh, finally, uh, the leading uh, merchandise company within Viking things, uh, Grim Frost. So with that said, I would like to take you through the summary of the uh, um, financial terms of the acquisitions disclosed this morning before we're entering the company presentations. So the aggregated uh, day one purchase prices for all the acquisitions announced this morning were uh, 2.7 billion uh, on a cash and debt free basis approximately 2.1 billion being paid in cash and approximately 0.6 billion is paid uh, in shares. And uh, the fairly high ratio of cash paid is driven partly by there is uh, some VC and financial owners uh, in, in the, one of the most significant acquisitions uh, that are kind of uh, exiting the business. Uh, the maximum uh, additional consideration amounting to 2 billion, which is as usual subject to fulfillment of agreed milestones, both operational and financial, over a period up to eight years. That 2 billion, 1 billion are to be paid up, uh, up to 1 billion are paid in cash and furthermore 1 billion in shares. So the aggregated maximum consideration amounts to 4.7 billion. Um, looking at, uh, to give you some um, uh, insight into how this earnout works. So we are sharing uh, the following. So to achieve the max, uh, maximum additional consideration of the acquired companies, the combined uh, aggregated uh, operation EBIT would be exceeding 6 billion uh, from, from today or up until March uh, 2029, over the upcoming eight years. And to illustrate this further, to, to achieve the maximum consideration milestone on year five, that year only, we the acquired companies are estimated to generate 1 billion in operational EBIT during that financial year, ending March 2026. 
the estimated or preliminary uh, surplus value for all the acquired companies is uh, 4.5 billion. And this will be amortized as usual over uh, a, a straight period of five years, according to Embracer's accounting standard principles. So looking at the financial impact of all the acquisitions. So the net sales contribution we are estimating to be between two to three billion during the next financial year, starting April 1st, uh, 2022 and ending March 2023. And profitability-wise, we estimate an operational EBIT contribution to be 300 to 550 during the same financial year, ending March 2023. During the remaining half year, uh, Q3 and Q4, the run rate is expected to be in the lower end of the above-mentioned range. And to be clear, Crazy Labs is by far the most impactful contributor, and that is estimated to be closed during the end of the current quarter ending March. Uh, an extra uh, general meeting will be held the 23rd of August, uh, and you got, uh, or it was published uh, in invite for this, this morning, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, the, the board the board doesn't have a mandate to uh, to give out shares uh, enough. We, we got a new mandate in February, and now we need a new mandate to close all these transactions. So this that's why we're having this extra general meeting. I would like to to repeat that uh, we still have a strong balance sheet with a sizable net cash position to support further M&A going forward. And uh, we continue to have many ongoing discussions with entrepreneurs, creators, companies to join the family, including large or even transformative acquisitions that potentially could create new operating groups. So with that said, I would like to welcome uh, the team from Crazy Labs and uh, CEO of DECA online. Hello, Ken. Hello there. And uh, Sagi, Guy, Nurit. Hi. Hi. How are you, Tel Aviv? Uh, very hot. <laughs> very excited. <laughs> uh, we just uh, a half an hour ago we announced to the uh, employees. Uh, we we asked them to be a little bit more quiet so so you can hear us, but they are very very excited uh, about this. So <laughs> an hour of excited. Uh, fantastic! You are very welcome to the group, and please send uh, send them uh, my best regards here from uh, the headquarters in Sweden. So I would like to leave over the stage to you. I will try to to uh, uh, manage the slides here. So uh, I will leave over to you, Sagi, and, and then uh, please feel free to introduce uh, yourself, uh, your team, and then uh, the company. Sure. Um, so my name is Sagi Schlisser. Um, uh, I've, uh, I'm the uh, one of the founders of uh, Crazy Labs um, uh, and the CEO uh, since 2010. Uh, I have a strong technological background. I've done eight years in the army in tech uh, um, uh, positions. I had then a startup in uh, the B2B area, and then I, I've done 14 years of insure tech. Um, uh, Last position before uh, before creating Crazy Labs was in Sapiens, another created company. Um, and I loved moving from B to B to C. <laughs> For me, it was a you know big, big great change. You are uh, uh, you you go direct to consumer, which is which is amazing. And, um, so this is a little bit about me. I believe in um, in the beginning. I I used to call myself. Uh, the chief day uh, officer of the company. I believe in DNAs. I believe in in the teams. 
in what we prepare, and, and that aligns then usually everything else aligns as well. And uh, we, we have an, an, an amazing uh, team, two of them, they will introduce themselves and then we can introduce a little bit about uh, the, the company as well. Hi, I'm Guy. I joined the uh, Sagi and the team here in 2012 as a CEO, COO. Uh, I also come from a uh, tech company, actually, Sagi and I worked in our first startup together in 1999 uh, and uh, 2000 in the B2B, and then I also had my own startup that I founded and was very happy to join uh, Sagi again in 2002 and very excited to be here today. And I'm Rita Jemini, also from Tel Aviv, joined Crazy Labs about uh, eight years ago. I have financial background and half of my career I was a CEO of public company based on NASDAQ. And then I moved to the private market since uh, my kids were born and I'm very happy and excited about this uh, transaction. Okay, so... Uh, very well, uh, uh, so uh, plug in. Let's tell you a little bit about Crazy Labs. Uh, we can talk all day about it, but uh, just the highlight. So, so uh, for uh, since uh, 2013, we've been a top downloaded company. Um, uh, we excel in, in 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 the marketing side, but also in in game creation, uh, and we evolved uh, into uh, two main lines of business that will enhance a little bit about them in, in, in the next slide, but we have both casual with strong uh, lifestyle and female-oriented game boots, uh, with Super Stylist being our front-runner uh, game, which is consistently growing and showing really a, a great outcome, uh, and we have uh, also really a, a good pipeline. Uh, and hyper casual, which was the genre that uh, evolved out of the fact that uh, there are billions of people with the uh, gaming device in their pocket, but not all of them uh, are, are hardcore gamers, so they can just play for a few minutes each time um, and download a lot of games, and, uh, and we are one of the top hyper casual publishers. Uh, last year, uh, in 2020 alone, we, we, uh, we had almost 1 billion downloads in the app stores and we accumulated so far in our history over four and a half billion downloads, uh, which is a really a nice amount. And we have around 110 um, uh, uh, unique monthly active users. So uh, um, uh, kind of our uh, uh, highlight KPIs. Uh, if we uh, look at Super Stylist, uh, uh, then it was released in 2019, and you will see the trajectory, the upward trajectory. It started as a, as a game which was doing in hundreds of thousands, and now it's doing um, millions on a monthly basis. The revenue is growing, contribution is growing, and, uh, and also the, the in-app uh, uh, component. So uh, uh, around that, uh, we've built a lot of knowledge and gained a lot of... Uh, uh, strong uh, teams uh, that, that, was, that were working on, on launching Super Stylist and are now also involved in launching other projects. Um, if, we, if we look at, at Crazy Lab, so our vision was to have these really strong two pillars. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, casual, uh, uh, creating casual gaming, ca deep casual gaming experiences. Uh, and as we we already told you that we are uh, started as tech people. We have some tech background. We are we also love the content part. But everything we create, we create with the mindset that if it's going to be successful, then let's create it in a way which will then enable us to do it again and again in a better way. So when we create a new game genre or type, we create it actually as a small uh, 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 platform that is repeatable. Uh, we believe in that way, uh, that is the, the best way for us to, uh, to, to create uh, uh, things. And we've, did, we've done that in, in, in the casual, in the lifestyle side, but also in the puzzle RPG, in the games that will tell you that we're going to, uh, that, uh, to launch. And it's a mix there with the uh, in-app component and, uh, and, and users that uh, some of them are becoming uh, uh, repetitive, highly repetitive, uh, users and paying users and, and high mon monetization.
side, we have hyper casual. These are smaller games, a bigger funnel. Uh, out of them, a very small amount of games that we that we test going to launch, and we'll discuss the process a little bit. Uh, but it really made us a, a powerhouse of marketing, understanding teams and what can be successful on the App Store and, and, and how and, and building a, a very, very strong marketing team. And we see that it really helps uh, the casual side on the hyper casual side, bringing from the game expertise and, 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 and from the uh, hyper casual side, the marketing capabilities, uh, being innovative and, and, and being really agile in, in marketing our games. And in the middle, we, we manage to find opportunities where we, we are entrepreneurs. And when we find things that are not defocusing for us and can leverage from that, so we also uh, go after them. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's very uh, interesting and dynamic atmosphere. Um, so uh, you heard a little bit about the, the three of us, uh, but we have, by the way, a very strong uh, leadership team uh, um, uh, on casual, on hyper casual with the game owners, uh, with a lot of experience in the industry from different uh, companies and, and a lot of people that, uh, that, was, that were raised in-house. Um, which is great, um, a team of over 300 uh, people and expanding, uh, focusing in, in, in few main geographies. So here in Israel, where we started, is also our headquarters uh, in Tel Aviv. But we also have a very strong team in China, uh, an amazing team in Macedonia. Um, and recently, we also added the uh, offices in Germany, and we also have a very strong team in, in the Ukraine. Uh, part of the way we feel we are innovative in, in hyper-casual and in finding developers, we are a developer that at some point uh, started also helping other developers and doing publishing. So we have both in hyper-casual and Guy might, might talk about it a bit more. But we said, let's, let's try and meet uh, developers before they even know that they are developers in hyper-casual. So we've built this hubs program where we find really talented individuals, we, we sort them, they submit uh, uh, tests and games, and, and we help them uh, become hyper-casual developers and launch their games uh, to, uh, to millions of people around the world. And it's, it's a very exciting program uh, in, in many geographies. We started in, in India and in Israel, and now it's expanded to other territories, Serbia, Turkey, Poland, and South Africa, and, and more is planned in the in the pipeline. So, uh, and we bring a lot of value to our external developers because uh, unlike maybe a lot of other publishers, which are pure publishers, we are also developers. So they kind of appreciate the fact that we can give them tips both on their game and also on the marketing. So it gives us in hyper casual, a big competitive advantage. Covering a little bit casual and lifestyle RPG. So, uh, so uh, this, this is kind of our uh, evolution line. Uh, we started with kind of smaller casual titles in lifestyle and evolved into bigger games, bigger meta game, uh, uh, role playing games and, 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 and creating uh, social interactions and, and PVPs. Uh, we also have had good relationship with uh, media partners and we've launched uh, games with, uh, with Sony, with Mattel, but I think uh, our most significant partner to date is Zag Animation, a French company that has uh, Ladybug, uh, which we launched a runner game with them, uh, which is very, very successful. And we signed with them to launch uh, next year together with the, uh, with the movie launch, uh, a puzzle RPG uh, game. Um, so one of the things that we have done, we, we identified uh, the puzzle RPG market, uh, it's a very interesting market for us to evolve into, and uh, we are now in soft launch uh, of one of, of our first titles there, Once Upon a Match. Uh, but as, as I revealed earlier, we, we build things uh, in a way we believe that can be repeated. So we've built it actually as a puzzle RPG platform. And when we had the opportunity and, and Zag asked us to, uh, to, to think about what we can launch next, so we, we, we proposed to them to do a bubble shooter based on that. A platform which is going to launch with a movie uh, in Q2 or end of Q1, Q2 uh, next year. 
uh, and soft launch towards the end of this year. So uh, really exciting uh, evolution on our casual uh, uh, business. Uh, the business is, uh, is growing in casual. Uh, 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 we expect uh, 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 the stronger growth uh, as we go forward and the new launches, which take more time on the Puzzle RPG platform, uh, uh, will start uh, uh, materializing, but uh, uh, we are constantly increasing. And, and among that, Super Stylist is taking bigger and bigger position out of the total uh, 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 pie um, uh, and getting really high valued users uh, that last for, uh, that play for a long, long time in the game uh, with the social network that is really enthusiastic about the game and, and where it's going forward. Uh, it's the most downloaded fashion game uh, in 2020 on the app stores. If we go to hyper casual, that. Yeah, so uh, in 2020, we had 11 uh, launches, and uh, this year we plan uh, at least uh, twice as many launches in hyper casual. Uh, some examples that appear here, for example, tie dye, that was one of the biggest one, had uh, 70 million downloads in the first nine months. Uh, we are very focused on uh, expanding our presence into countries that are su very suitable to the hyper-casual business model. Today, Turkey is considered uh, probably the most successful country in uh, hyper-casual. There is kind of a gold rush to the hyper-casual today in Turkey that everybody are, uh, want to develop uh, games now. And we opened the hub in Istanbul. We hired a, a small team there and we opened the hub together with one of the universities. And we teach them how to, to make hyper-casual games. And then they continue to work with us at least for one year further and launch game with us. And we also are very focused on India, where we just acquired a, a small uh, studio that is called Filesco. And they, they already launched with us uh, three games successfully. Two of them appear here, the, the acrylic nails and the soap cutting. And those uh, three games that they launched uh, with us already generate nice revenues and reach 200 million downloads. And we acquired them just recently. We actually just closed this deal. And now we have a very uh, strong presence in Mumbai. And we have another uh, studio that we work locally in Hyderabad. And we also opened an, a hub in Hyderabad. And we are very focused on the India market. That is now we see it as a huge opportunity for us. And as Aguy mentioned, we are also doing it in other places, such as South Africa and others. In terms of the hyper-casual process, so it's first about the developer relationship, relationships, building them. We have it split. We have it split between external developers, which with which we are launching about 70% of the new games, and we have internal studios with whom we are launching about more or less 30% of the new games with the internal studios. So it starts with this uh, local presence and with building the relationship, and we work with hundreds of uh, developers around the world. Then we test hundreds of prototypes every month, and there is a very clear funnel to success. We do it very rapidly, the UA and monetization testing, and eventually we launch the games and we focus on the contribution margin. And by the end of the year, we, we aim to launch about three game, three new hyper-casual games every month. And just to focus what hyper-casual is, for those who don't know, it's like the snake and the Tetris that all of us used to play. Today, they, are ju they just got their own genre and they are called hyper-casual. So they used to be just games that everybody plays. And today they, they have a name, it's called the uh, hyper-casual games. Very important part of our uh, competitive advantage in hyper-casual is our uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, we have a, a self-serve dashboard that those hundreds of developers, they can test the games independently. They don't need us to run the UA campaign and everything for them. We just uh, close the deal with them. We give them the access and we approve the test uh, in terms of the quality of the test, but then they can run it by themselves, the test. They can see the results. It's very transparent and, uh, and they get attached to work with us through this dashboard because they really like it that they can iterate and, and learn how the game works. Other tools that we have are uh, deep uh, machine learning that we use for the ad monetization side, for uh, how aggressive we, uh, we are with the ad monetization. We run A-B tests, continuous A-B tests to optimize 
the game in the background and a few other technologies that we use to make our UA user acquisition and ad monetization as efficient as possible in this in this industry it's a big advantage yeah uh, yeah so perhaps i could step in here uh, or nurit uh, are you online here perhaps you can just uh, tell us a bit about your your revenue growth uh, so you can see that revenue grew tremendously in the past two years. Uh, we had uh, in 19, 2019, we ended with $72 million revenues. We uh, reached a $100 million mark in 2020, and we continue to grow. Here you can see the last 12-month numbers with $153 million, and we continue to work hard to increase these numbers. And you can yeah. see also the breakdown. The casual and hypercasual, both segments are growing. Hypercasual is growing a bit faster, but uh, we expect both segments to continue to grow this year and the years to come. Thank you. And uh, we are expecting, as you're stating, a significant growth uh, coming out from you. You have a fantastic uh, team and, and pipeline uh, and a strategy to achieve this, which I, I, uh, I, I highly believe in. So. Um, and we have a, a very long-term commitment uh, earnout model as well to incentivize you and, and, and uh, the management team. Uh, yes, we are very, very excited to continue and do this together for a really long, long time and uh, great. Yeah, so so uh, Sagi is coming into the you know rationale. Uh, I, I can just say a bit here, but uh, I would like to just hear you out as well. Obviously, I, I just felt a very, very strong uh, uh, entrepreneurship from you and the team. Uh, it's amazing you've been through, you know, a lot of ups and downs, uh, but uh, you are really a, an amazing company to adapt to changes, and I think you are the winner of tomorrow. Uh, and you have a strong uh, pipeline and hyper casually the way how you work is. Somehow a bit similar to what I, what what you're doing in in premium games. Even though the games is very different, but you work with external developers and you publish them um, in combination to have your own uh, in-house development. Uh, Ken, are you online here as well? Yep, I'm here. So, uh, Ken, uh, being the leader of the Decca Games and now having Crazy Labs being, being part of the vertical and assist the company to do the existing uh, uh, companies within Decca, uh, what, uh, what, what synergies do you see here? Uh, I, I see a lot. Um, I'm really excited to, to have the team join. There's a lot of similarities between our companies, even though we're doing very different types of businesses. Uh, we thought that the culture, the people, the drive, uh, there's so much similarities and they're going to fit in really well with the rest of the group. Um, but in particular, uh, Crazy Labs has this immense dynamic um, business where they've been able to be successful in all different types of the industry. And I think that's really important uh, going forward as the, the mobile industry is adapting, uh, is, is changing very quickly. Um, but it's really based on their technology and the team that they have. And... DECA, I think, can really utilize their publishing capabilities and the technology that they have to support the products that we have, um, not only within DECA's live operations business, but also within the studios in Canada, in Canada that already are with us. Um, and vice versa, I think that DECA has an um, immense uh, foundation in live operations, which, which can only help create these labs in their, in their casual titles. Thank you. Uh, and it, and sorry, the last thing is that um, together uh, we, we plan to tackle a lot more M&A as well. Uh, I think both DECA and Crazy Labs will be very active on the M&A side. Yeah, and it's quite uh, funny that we saw this morning the press release of uh, the Crazy Labs acquisition in India, <laughs> that guy mentioning. Uh, <laughs> that's, I think, is fantastic. So it's already happening yeah. in a few minutes. <laughs> Just a word on our side, I think uh, 
uh, for us when it's all about people and, and, and this is what we liked about uh, Embracer meeting uh, uh, Lars and, and, and Jacob and Ken and, uh, and, and for us we, we connect with people so and it's the most important thing and we felt entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs and people to people that we share values, uh, the way we look at teams, uh, uh, the way we, we look at uh, uh, gaming, and the way we look at uh, what we want to do uh, uh, next, which is continue to grow amazing business in gaming and do it together. And, uh, and for us, it was, it was critical. So, uh, um, and, and we found a place where we feel that uh, is, is, is our next home, which is really a, an emotional word for us. So uh, it's not, home is not anywhere. And we feel that Embracer can, can really be our home. And uh, as I said, we, Embracer also has this amazing name because it already makes you feel embraced. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Sagi. Uh, and likewise, I can't wait to meet your, your team uh, one day and, and, uh, and to see how you are able to you know, be integrated and how to, to to work together with the rest of the company. Uh, it will be very exciting. Um, so with, this, with that said, I, I'd like to thank the team from Crazy Labs and Ken, and uh, I would like to move uh, over. So thank you very much, and uh, you. Uh, feel free to stay online. Uh, we move over from Tel Aviv to Copenhagen. So welcome, Søren, uh, Mikkel, and Anton for Coffee Stain. Thank you, Lars. Hi, Lars. Hey. So uh, welcome to the group. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. We are super excited about uh, joining uh, Embracer Group. Very. And uh, if our voices are a little rusty, it's because we um, celebrated this yesterday with the, <laughs> with the <laughs> resident. It's also very, very excited. So, uh, yeah, so my name is Søren, and I'm the uh, CEO and, uh, and co-founder of uh, CoShip. And uh, my name is uh, Mikkel, and I am a creative director and also co-founder of uh, GoShip Games. And we are uh, six founders uh, of, uh, of GoShip, and we'll get back to that. Um, maybe you can change the, the slide, uh, Lars. Sure. We can uh, see the, the, the team here. Uh, but actually, uh, the, the, as you can see, we started in 2016, and uh, we'll let Mikkel start that, because I was not part of that uh, initially. No, so besides that, we were, we were five people coming from uh, another company that uh, was closed, and uh, we uh, are just as when the company was closed, we got together and said, hey, shouldn't we start our own company? Uh, we had an idea uh, for a game that was uh, to be G Block Galactic. Uh, and the, the five of us had uh, the skills uh, to actually create this game ourselves. Uh, we are a team that uh, is, uh, have more than uh, 20 years of experience in the game industry. Each, each, each of us, yeah, uh, not together. <laughs> and uh, we are a group of uh, three uh, highly skilled programmers, and art director, and me as a yeah, I don't know, game director, game di uh, game designer. Um, and we got together and we started working on Deep Galactic, and we very quickly realized that we were needing uh, a dedicated uh, CEO, uh, both to help us uh, uh, fund the company, but also uh, build the company. Um, yeah, and then uh, fate would have it that you moved your office in, into the same office building where I was working in a different uh, game company just on, on the second floor. Uh, so I was invited down by Mikkel. Me and Mikkel, we worked together for 10 years back in the days. And, and uh, yeah, we kind of had like an unset thing that we wanted to work together someday, but yes. again, then do our own company. So I was down there and I was very envious. Like this, this was just the startup uh, smell, right? Like this, this was so exciting. So I went back and yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we talked about it and we, then we were basically just offered the uh, Sam to be, uh, become CEO for the company. And uh, I said, yes, which is a decision I do not regret. Because yeah. <laughs> it's been an amazing journey since then. Uh, then of course we, we, we got some money, we got some in, in investment, we got on, uh, collaboration with Copystain, which has been throughout all, all these years almost. 
and we've been building up a team. Uh, you can see the, the beautiful picture of this uh, pirate <laughs> uh, developer team. Uh, and, and we've been uh, skillfully selecting these people, uh, some of them from our existing network, some uh, new people, some young blood uh, as well. Uh, and we're trying to uh, still uh, keeping uh, a lean, uh, efficient machine with everybody having hands on the, uh, on the product uh, being as effective as, uh, as possible. Uh, but maybe we should talk about the game that made us, the Deep Rock Galactic game made us, the Deep Rock Galactic. So, yeah. Yeah. so Galactic is a first-person co-op shooter. And in the game, you uh, play as a team of four dwarves who work for this uh, mining corporation, Deep Rock Galactic. And they send you on missions into uh, alien planets in order to mine them for precious minerals. Um, so it's all about getting out alive with the group, you can say, uh, and it's all about going on an adventure with your friends and having a fun time. Yeah, there's a lot of camaraderie in this game. It's yeah. about this thing about working together, and we set out a mission to to create uh, a, a, the best co-op game ever, right? And, and we also put that as a statement for the, for the company. The company motto is co-op first, which also relates to the way we uh, work with our fans, where we have a collaboration with the fans, you can say. When we started working on the game, we made a decision that we wanted to develop the game in what we call open development, which yeah, which means that we do it. We, we have very few secrets. We uh, put out what we're working on and, this, and, and tell our fans about it. Uh, so we have not much secrecy about what we do in the company. Uh, and there's two huge uh, benefits to uh, producing a game in open development. The, f the first uh, is that we don't waste much time on working on features that are not going into the game because we m make our decision on uh, based on what uh, our audience and fans already want and are demanding. Um, and then we shape those features together with them, uh, which means that we basically deliver 100% of the work we put into uh, into producing the game is actually ending up in the game. Uh, that's very effective. Then obviously uh, producing a game in open developments is for the whole developing team is just immensely satisfying because we get instant feedback from our community uh, and uh, yeah, that's just satisfying. Yeah, there's also a way to kind of uh, make this kind of big game compared to how small a team we are, because we have all the contributions from the fans in terms of like finding bugs and helping us translate the game and promote the game to the to their friends and so on. So Yeah. And um, to some degree, I think you could say that it's also part of our marketing strategy. And now we're part of a, a Embracer group and we are extremely proud to be uh, now a sister company to Coffee Stain. We've been working together very closely with Anton and Albert and the other uh, great guys from Coffee Stain and and now being in this position in, in Embracer Group just feels like a, the natural next step for Ghost Ship uh, and a way for us to uh, further expand on the uh, Deep Rock Galactic IP to create new IPs and, and, and to uh, also move on on our um, interest in, uh, in, in investing into game startups. Yeah, because you, you have a very uh, I would say uh, you are well positioned with your or um, colleagues in in Denmark and and well elsewhere in the world as well, obviously. But you you already have made a few investments into other companies in Denmark, haven't you? Yeah, so we we've, we've made one and we have one uh, ongoing, which will likely close uh, quite soon. Yeah. And, and we'll, we are looking at, at, at several more uh, when we started um, uh, announcing that we were interested in doing this and, and had the ability to do it. We got quite a lot of attention, uh, especially also the not, 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 of course, people want money, but they also want the knowledge that, that we and, and Coffee Stain uh, have on how to uh, develop and publish uh, indie games and early access games and early access games yeah. specifically and Steam, the Steam platform expertise. Yeah. I think it's very interesting, and, and I, I highly believe in, in you know the vision and the strategy you put forward. And super excited that you also have agreed on a you know very long term alignment, eight years uh, incentive for for you. And, and uh, you know I think you will contribute a lot to both you know the coffee stain uh, ecosystem, but obviously the wider embracer group. Yeah. 
we uh, we expect to. Yeah. Yes. So thank you very much. And uh, with that said, uh, I would like to uh, say again thank you to Copenhagen and then move over to Anton and uh, uh, yeah Anton and Trollhättan in a way. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, very exciting day obviously, super happy about Ghost Chip. It's been a long, long discussions with you guys to get you in, into, into the group and I was happy that we finally could make it work out. Um, but uh, today we also have another uh, announcement and that is like the is the trigger acquisition. Uh, and. Um, is a trigger is a, is a quite small uh, company down in uh, Trollhättan, which we have been working with for a couple of years now as well. Uh, and uh, it was actually one of the first games that we uh, signed in our in our publishing after publishing was started as a separate uh, company. Uh, and um, is a trigger is mainly known for Huntdown, uh, which is an old school uh, arcade uh, platformer shooter. Uh, which, uh, when it was pitched to us, it was supposed to take uh, one year to develop, but in the end, it took, uh, you know, four years to get it to the market. Uh, but uh, takes a lot of time to make great games, uh, and um, it turned out well. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, we, it just felt like a small, nice team that uh, I think is going to be a very uh, natural addition to, to the Coffee Stain uh, group. Uh, and uh, it's a trigger is becoming a part of Coffee Stain, not as Ghost Ship, which is going to uh, live as a sister company. Uh, and um, yeah, just super happy pretty much to have uh, is trigger as, as part of Coffee Stain now. Uh, and uh, the, the plan with uh, is a trigger is to establish this little company in Trollhättan that will grow just as Coffee Stain does slowly, but you know with with the development as as uh, as they need more people they will grow and uh, create new amazing IP just like Huntdown and uh, hopefully new up new IP as well uh, and um, yeah can't can't wait to see what what we will make with is a trigger in the coming years. Thank you, Anton. I think we all uh, that love uh, retro and arcade uh, are absolutely amazed of the product of Huntdown. Uh, it's one, it's really well received, great reviews. And uh, I know there's a lot of love from uh, a lot of uh, uh, fans out there. It's also now actually coming in a physical edition. So uh, it's close yeah. to my heart and uh, super excited to have them on board. So uh, yes, thank you, Anton. Uh, with that said, we are leaving Trollhättan and uh, moving over to uh, Amsterdam. Arthur, Martin, John. Thank you, Lars. Obviously, we are uh, very, very excited to be welcoming Force Field to the Vertigo and Embracer family. Um, but I'm going to let them speak uh, and, and introduce their company. I think it's a, a better way to approach this, but uh, Arthur Hoffman, as you can see, is the CEO of Force Field and Martin Deronda is the creative director. Uh, and so I thought, Arthur, if you would um, introduce the, the company to our audience and give a little bit of description of uh, your journey and, and how you've moved into VR. Why don't you, why, hello Arthur, sorry for jumping in here. Why don't you, because I, we spoke yesterday and I'm very highly impressed about your, your background. Why don't we tell, you know, Tell us about with your background before starting the force field and then jumping over to force field. Sure, Lars, can do that. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, myself in the industry uh, since uh, the early 90s uh, with the arrival of CD-ROM at the time, multimedia, CDI was a whole, whole uh, road to uh, where we are today. So I've worked at companies like Infogrames, Atari, uh, Disney in the US, I've been hopping around from country to country a lot and uh, back where I'm originated from in Amsterdam. Um, the Force Field Studio, uh, the core team has been working together for well over 15 years, so we have a really very uh, uh, senior uh, management team on board. Always been very interested in, in new emerging technologies, that's how I got into the industry as well when I saw digital 
uh, distribution being possible on, on CDs. And, and that's been, been more or less uh, through our history as, as a company and uh, my, uh, my own uh, runway as well uh, in my career. Uh, things uh, we worked for Amazon on new platforms. We worked for uh, Microsoft porting Halo to mobile devices. So yeah, it's really we did a, did a lot of OEM work and very specialized work for hire, uh, making uh, showcase software for new platforms, new devices. So when we saw VR uh, starting to emerge and the affordability of the new uh, devices that started to come up, we got very interested. And I started working on some R&D uh, next to uh, our other work. And very quickly, we got in contact with Oculus, uh, who was, of course, preparing the launch of the Rift platform, the Rift device. And yes, they asked if we, if we wanted to make uh, make a game for, for uh, the Oculus Rift when that was uh, in uh, still uh, in gestation at, uh, at, at uh, Facebook. So yeah, and that was uh, 2015, and we haven't looked back. Uh, over the time, we did in a very wide variation of all kinds of VR experiences and games, and always uh, trying to explore and demonstrate what the possibilities of VR are. Through that time, also we we're, were also quite uh, technically oriented company, so we've been able to uh, enormous amount of technology uh, specific to VR. And we've worked with great franchises. Uh, we worked on the Star Trek franchise. We worked with National Geographic doing travel uh, uh, applications. So yeah, and uh, today, of course, uh, seeing the market grow, we were looking what the next step for the company was. Very excited, of course, to to go into less business to business, more business, uh, more consumer related business. And uh, yeah, that's uh, when we started talking with Vertigo. Uh, here we are today. Thanks, Arthur. Um, diving in a little bit further to um, that process as you have started talking with us and, and what led you to uh, joining the Vertigo and Embracer families, could you sort of walk us through the rationale for the deal from your perspective and, and what opportunities uh, do you see this creating for Force Field? Yeah, as I said, the business to business, of course, was a great, great way to, uh, to get on board with VR, as uh, there was not a big market in 2015, 2016. So uh, that definitely gave us the opportunity to explore the possibilities and to uh, to uh, uh, work on our uh, pipeline, our technologies, and grow the team. Um, and we saw, of course, with the growth, the rapid growth that the market's been been uh, doing over the last 18 months, we definitely saw, okay, now is the moment that we can do the next step and go over to uh, more of the passion of the studio is making games that we want to make and not being uh, asked to make a specific kind of game by, by a client. Um, we knew uh, Richard and, and Vertigo, of course, as uh, fellow, fellow countrymen, an extremely successful VR company. So we've had uh, continuous talks uh, with Vertigo over the time. And when we wanted to make that step, we, uh, we had a discussion with Richard and it was clear that this was a really, really good match to uh, join the two companies and come together and being actually the biggest dedicated VR studio in the world today with I think over 140 employees. And Martin, from your perspective, in terms of uh, the, the creative view of the type of games you're looking at, what does this uh, combination do for from that perspective? You know, uh, you know, I think uh, as Arthur mentioned, you know, I think it's uh, it's fair to say that we've more or less grown along with the growth of the VR market over the past six years. And, and uh, Arthur just pointed out, we really, really enjoyed a very close partnership with uh, with Oculus, working on. Uh, creative work for higher launch titles for almost every single one of their VR devices that they launched. And because of that, we've been able to more or less build and grow this, what I think is amazingly talented and wonderful uh, group of uh, that are now capable of delivering best-in-class VR experiences in games. And, and obviously now that the uh, VR market is growing and you've got next-gen devices that are going to be hitting the market soon, I, I believe that we're starting to see the moment where Consumers are going to be looking for full-featured console-style AAA VR games, and I'd like to think that our fantastic team um, 
we're more or less perfectly positioned to deliver on those kinds of expectations. And the only question that remained for us was, will we be doing that uh, independently uh, or as part of a, a larger group? And, and, and the answer was more or less quite simple. And when you have the opportunity to partner with uh, yourselves, arguably one of the most uh, successful developer publishers in VR over the past five years, and you're also located in the same neighborhood, uh, this opportunity to create the world's biggest VR studio, a true VR powerhouse, uh, and which will allow us to focus on on uh, truly creative VR development instead of uh, exciting, but still uh, the creative work for high grade stuff that we've been doing uh, was simply an opportunity that we uh, couldn't pass on. And 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 that's obviously even disregarding the fact that Vertigo uh, is part of the Embracer Group and and a subsidiary of Caution and Deep Silver because. As far as I'm concerned, that, that was the icing on the cake. Being part of such a large and diverse group with all these amazingly talented uh, and different development studios, and some of which we, we uh, have been listening to uh, today, I think it's tantalizing from a, a creative and a commercial point of view in, in terms of VR. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we're able now to engage in discussions with our fellow uh, new uh, colleagues and studios about bringing some of these beloved franchises into the world of VR, extremely exciting. Yeah, and certainly from a, our perspective, uh, bringing together these two, stringing together these two studios allows us to uh, much more rapidly grow in terms of our internal development capability and, and what we can bring in terms of AAA VR. Uh, we, we've talked about this a lot, you know, as a group, but the for those who uh, may not know, we're certainly uh, the VR market continues to grow rapidly. We're seeing uh, continued uh, growing investments from first party platforms. Uh, to grow the install base of this market and um, really believe that this this uh, transaction helps us uh, stay in and continue to be a leader in this in this segment. Uh, from your perspective, Arthur and Martin, uh, what do you see this this acquisitions? Um, you know, what, what does this mean for the the VR landscape? And, and maybe a little bit more of what you see the group's ability to do. Well, I think I think uh, uh, we're definitely showing uh, the, the the larger game industry uh, and the route to uh, to success in VR. Uh, Vertigo has already done that, and, and now we're we're really uh, upgrading uh, the whole company to a to a new level. A lot of the uh, the bigger publishers and, and uh, colleague studios have always been 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 uh, waiting for it to happen, and I think we're definitely uh, sending out a clear signal. Together with, of course, the growth that everybody is, is noticing in the market, and I think we're going to be uh, taking a lot of uh, people along in our uh, slipstream uh, into this uh, new and exciting uh, entertainment platform. Yeah, I, I echo that. You know, this it feels like a perfect uh, combination. We've got Vertigo and Force Field as veteran uh, VR developers. Then you've got the very successful publishing power and know-how of Vertigo Publishing. And then we have the, uh, if I can call it that, the IP candy shop of Embracer, uh, which I think is a, is a recipe for, for creative and commercial success because you know, the, the market is growing, the stakes are getting bigger. Um, yeah, and, and you've got consumers craving for uh, uh, console style AAA VR experiences. So I think there's never been a more exciting moment for VR, both commercially and creatively. And, and I think the coming five years are going to be uh, are going to be amazing. If you're a hardcore VR gamer and you like uh, some of Embrace's most popular IP, then I think you have every right to be excited by this announcement and partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, Arthur, Martin. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, about what will uh, what the future will bring uh, with you and, and we are. So with that said, I would like to thank you, the team in uh, Amsterdam and uh, LA, and uh, move over to somewhere in France. Uh, where are you? You are to camping. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> I, I don't know if Clemens is there today. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I absolutely I am uh, following. Uh, the presentation of uh, 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 friends uh, in VR. Um, uh, it's for Couch Media. This is a big day, and uh, 
uh, we are uh, about this industry is about creativity and uh, other companies believe in building um, a few IPs um, uh, bigger every year. We believe in diversification and uh, uh, VR is uh, is very close to our heart because it's a swing at a far pace than uh, the general uh, business and I, there are other areas where we believe um, uh, we we can uh, 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 link a play and uh, this is narrative games. This takes me to Digix Arts where uh, uh, w which we are presenting now. Um, two years ago, uh, we, uh, this was the first touch point with uh, DigiXR, with the uh, road, the road, as it was called at the time. And uh, we, we, I mean, we see hundreds and hundreds of games, right? But then we are all looking for this, um, the, 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 the hidden gem. We are looking for something uh, we have not seen before. And uh, the road really ticked all these boxes. So we we're really uh, following uh, closely uh, the, the uh, development of the, the, the game itself and then uh, got in touch with the team behind it. And uh, I must say uh, it was uh, great to uh, uh, see the Montpellier in their office now. And uh, we immediately clicked. Yeah? And uh, so, Johan and uh, Anlo, please uh, uh, tell me, uh, tell us all about your story and uh, your vision it's a, it's an amazing unique uh, setup that you have there yeah so first of all uh, we are really happy and excited to join the Kosh and embracer family today uh, so we founded uh, digixart uh, so Yohan and i six years ago and uh, our goal is to create uh, meaningful uh, narrative uh, stories and uh, so i will let um, Explain uh, your hand. So yeah, we are working on the, the third title right now, like you said, Clemens, uh, Row 96, who is uh, launching, in fact, in a few days uh, on the uh, Wii 16 on the, on the Switch and PC. Uh, so it's a very exciting moment. Uh, it's a, it's a big year for us, <laughs> and uh, we are really happy to to join the the group uh, that will allow us to expand and to double the studio uh, very soon, uh, because we have a lot of ideas, we have a lot of things we want to make, and now we we can do it. So it's it's a really nice uh, thing, and uh, we are based also uh, in the south of France, as you can see on the map in Montpellier. It's a very nice area for video games. There are a lot of developers and, and talents here, a, lo a lot of nice uh, schools also uh, in the area. So it's, it allows us to, to expand quickly in the next uh, months because we have so many ideas we want to try uh, in the narrative adventure space, more than just narrative, in fact. So we want to explore new fields, how like how can multiplayer uh, interact with narrative, for example? Uh, this is kind of thing we want to try. Uh, so we are really innovative uh, based. Uh, Road 96 is a procedural narrative game that can sound a bit strange, but we, we managed to make this. So we believe we can do other new things in the future, very exciting for players. And when we see the, the whole the hype around the game, we are pretty sure it's a, it's a good way to go to try very different things. So it's it's very exciting moment. So as a as a as a publisher, we are always looking for uh, the next thing. Yeah, um, we are always looking for innovative uh, studios. And the, the, this team, uh, it, it is a small team. It's an indie studio, but uh, strategically, but, uh, strategically, I believe that uh, this is. Uh, a great launch uh, from for us as a global partner and big uh, waits until uh, a the road 96 launches but then uh, the future will really uh, uh, show uh, a, a good potential for for many of uh, similar games and this is a uh, a new area in, in a new um, uh, a type of games in, in our roster. We, as you know, Deep Silver and uh, Prime Meta and uh, uh, Ravenscourt, we have uh, 
and a, a wide portfolio of games, but narrative games are underrepresented. And this is now the starting point of, uh, we are opening a door uh, into uh, a new era. Yeah, and then when we look at all the IPs that are within Embrace, uh, we really think there are good uh, synergies we can make and, and uh, I think we lost you there, Johan. Ah, sorry. But, yeah, don't worry. But uh, I think we we need to thank you very much. And uh, again, very welcome to the group. And uh, thank you, Clemens, for joining this presentation as well. Uh, so leaving France, uh, we thank are very much. Uh, heading over to Denmark again and uh, Jylland. So uh, I think we have uh, Frederick and uh, Andre here. Uh, Andre from Saber on the call. Yes, and and and, and me. Ah, and Tim. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great to see yeah, all we're you. all here. We're all here. <laughs> I know he's in, in the middle of the night in the states, but uh, thank you for staying awake. No problem. It's very exciting for us. The um. The uh, the Slipgate and uh, Three the Realms, um, uh, you know, we've always been a big fan of of what they've done, the the legacy of Three Realms and the exciting new projects that Slipgate uh, is current has currently worked on is and is currently working on is are very exciting to us, and we feel that um, that we'll have many opportunities to do something exciting. And uh, Frederick, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Hi Lars. Hi Tim. Hey, hey. So finally, we got together in the same family. We got we we got to know each other a few years now uh, through THQ Nordic, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've been working together for yeah, well, it's almost five, six years now, yeah. in uh, in different capacities. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, why Embracer, uh, Frederick, and uh, Saber? So we uh, we started working with Saber. Uh, I think it's almost a few years ago now. Um, we uh, we had a very aligned strategy of all. Um, also with Tim and, and and Todd joining Saber. Uh, there's a lot of both creative and uh, and business alignments with uh, with Saber Interactive, and uh, we've had the the uh, the honor and pleasure of working together with Saber now for for some time on on various uh, various projects, and. Um, when when this opportunity uh, came to us, it was very clear that that Saber was the uh, perfect home for us. We also knew you, Lars, and we knew Embracer from uh, previous collaborations, uh, previous IP that we have worked together on a few years ago. Uh, so this uh, this was pretty much a match made in heaven for us. Thank you. And uh, why, can't you tell us a bit about you know how Slipgate is looking today? Absolutely. So uh, Slipgate was founded in uh, in 2017. The uh, the core team uh, was established way back in 2011 under the name Interceptor. Uh, we uh, we did the first uh, you can call it the first boomer shooter uh, that kind of uh, created this whole subgenre of old school retro first person shooters with uh, a very obscure game called Rise of the Triad. Um, it became kind of a viral hit. It was a very janky game, but a very fun game. Um, this was way back when uh, when Steam was still a, a uh, you know in its infancy almost, but um, but the game did incredibly well for us, and we built up Interceptor and and our team. Uh, we did a few more games. The last game we did, we uh, we sold to uh, to GHQ under Embracer, and then we in 2017 rebranded as a, a Slipgate. You know, we almost exclusively do uh, hardcore action games and first person shooters. As um, as some of, of you might know, Slipgate actually stems from uh, a series that Tim uh, was very involved with, uh, the Quake series, where mm -hmm. uh, the Slipgate portals were essentially uh, ways that you go through the different universes in the in the Quake universe, and um, and we named our studio uh, Slipgate because that resonates really well with what we do. We primarily focus on on hardcore old school uh, old school shooters. Um, over the past four years, we started expanding uh, what we do to uh, to other subgenres of the games industry. We um, 
we started helping out some of our good friends with some of their games. We, uh, we've built up an expertise uh, for almost a decade in uh, specifically Unreal Engine, uh, going back to uh, the early days of Unreal Engine 3, and then, of course, uh, following all the different revisions. Uh, and we started helping out other studios uh, within uh, also the THQ and Embracer family with, uh, with their games uh, using the Unreal Engine, helping them port the different games to other platforms. And this was a way for us to both learn more, but also uh, help out studios that um, we really like working with on, on other projects. Um, so as part of that, we established a porting department where we, we don't necessarily market ourselves as a porting studio, but we, uh, we like helping out studios that make games that resonate really well with what we like to do. Um, we then, uh, as part of that, also started co-developing. The, uh, the biggest game, uh, one of the biggest games of this year, Ghost Runner, we, uh, we co-developed uh, almost from, uh, from day one. Uh, we were presented with an early vertical slice of the game uh, a few years ago, and uh, have been working on that game together with uh, with uh, All In, One More Level, and 505 for uh, for a few years. Um, the game was released recently to uh, fantastic reviews. Um, we have also done all of the ports for the game, including uh, all the way from Switch to to the next gen uh, ray traced ports for uh, PS5 and, and Series X. Um, and then, last but not least, we have our internal developments where we're currently making uh, four games uh, internally at Slipgate, um, almost all original IP. The, um, the games range from uh, classic uh, hardcore first-person shooters. Um, we also have an unannounced real-time strategy game that we're working on uh, with, uh, with some great partners, one of them also being uh, THQ uh, from, from Embracer. So we have our hands in a lot of different things these days. But, um, but I think what, what's common for all of it is that it's all within this genre that we feel really comfortable with hardcore action games. Yes, as a hardcore uh, uh, action game studio, they fit so well with, with Saber and, and what we do and how we are improving our portfolio. And as Frederick said, you know his his uh, old retro shooters are are some of the games that 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 I worked on. I feel like I'm getting old, uh, but the uh, uh, but their future is more than just it, uh, updating retro shooters. Like he said, the portfolio is increasing, and and we you know really see exciting things, uh, Frederick, uh, for you and your teams in the future as well. Thank you so much, Tim. Yes. I moved slide over to 3D realms. Could you could you explain the, the connection here and, and uh, you know what what's the ambition is with uh, 3D realms? I know it's a well known brand for a lot of people. Absolutely, um, we uh, we have been working with 3D realms from uh, from day one. Uh, the uh, first game we did on the Slipgate uh, under the Interceptor name was actually a, a 3D realms IP. Um, Way back in the early days of the first-person shooters, uh, they uh, made a game under the Apogee name called Rise of the Triad, which was originally called Wolfenstein II Rise of the Triad. Mm -hmm. um, and the first game we did was a remake, a uh, reboot of that game. Um, so we had a, a long relationship with, uh, with 3D Realms. And uh, in 2014, we were lucky enough to, uh, to acquire uh, parts of 3D Realms and help build up a, uh, a new version of 3D Realms which uh, homes back to the, uh, you can call it the good old days of what 3D Realms were known for in the mid nineties. Uh, games like Duke Nukem, Max Payne, Shadow Warrior, Prey, and so on. A, a lot, of, lot of classic games that many of us grew up playing. Um, these days we have built up uh, 3D Realms as a, uh, as a new publisher and uh, call it a, a team builder. What we primarily do is build smaller development teams and create new IP, um, just as 3D Realms did back in the day. Among those uh, are games like uh, Iron Fury, which came out uh, last year, uh, which was a, a big success for us, a spiritual successor to the, the classic first-person shooter made popular with games like Quake and Duke Nukem. Um, we also have brand new IP and new teams that we're working together with, uh, Core DK and Wrath being uh, some of them. And then we're working together with, uh, with other uh, great partners, such as Interplay and uh, Nightdive, on bringing back some of the 
old school shooters, uh, which were part of the legacy of the 90s. Games like Sin, which was a game originally done by Ritual Entertainment, um, which was a studio formed by previous 3D Realms uh, employees. Uh, Kingpin as well, uh, kind of a forgotten classic, also from the mid 90s, uh, first person shooter. So as you can see, the theme under 3D Realms uh, is uh, mostly what it was back in the 90s. We focus on what, we, what we're good at and what we know best, which is hardcore first person shooters. We also have some new titles that are unannounced. Um, we have a big event coming up here uh, in, in a few weeks where we're going to announce a range of new titles uh, under the 3D Realms label. So we're incredibly excited to, uh, to have the honor to you know, follow and, and, and build this company that was founded uh, the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fantastic. Yes, yes. For, for us, having uh, uh, three rounds has a name that you're all familiar with and to you know now have these titles and these 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 legacy brands in our portfolio and to now be able to, to do a site with them for saber you know working with frederick and his team is is again very very exciting for us so we're we're, we're looking forward to it oh uh andre I know you have been working hard to get this done as well. Do you have, do you have any last uh, comments here uh, from the Sabre side on this? Well, I certainly want to welcome uh, uh, Sleepgate and uh, CD Realms and, and Frederick personally into the family of uh, Sabre and the Brady family. Like Frederick said, we met a um, few years ago and um, uh, I guess it was you know, the love from the first sight. We always looked at um, uh, Slipgate and Frederick as, um, I guess, Sabre in its uh, you know, younger days, meaning these guys are doing uh, some work for hire, they are working on original IPs, they are uh, publishing some of their games through uh, some other publishers, and uh, they're bringing some, uh, some other titles to market uh, themselves, which is uh, kind of similar to what we do. We certainly respect their creative abilities, we certainly respect their technical jobs. Uh, I would say that Frederick is a little bit of a you know, fearless kind of guy, which I certainly appreciate. Uh, when we started working together, we tried to uh, encourage him to take on one of a uh, super challenging project, which he was a little bit hesitant of uh, engaging, but uh, I managed to convince him and uh, he, did a very good, he and his team uh, did a very good job. And now we can clearly see the results of uh, uh, that um, uh, of those efforts. So I uh, have a very high degree of confidence that Slipgate will, and Three Realms will, will, will do very well as a member of Saber family and we will be able to grow this team and um, help elevate them, uh, come to graduate to the next level. Thank you so much. And, and, and I would like to say as well, I'm happy to see that uh, one of the Founders is also staying on board as advisor, Mike Nielsen, one of the most brilliant guys I know in the industry and I know since the 90s and, and the founder or uh, and, uh, and the past CEO of uh, 3D Realms. So uh, thank you so much and very welcome to the family. Uh, with that said, we would like to leave Denmark uh, and uh, move over to, to uh, Sweden again. And uh, I, I having the honor to present the last acquisition of this morning, which is a bit uh, different from the others, and it's uh, Greenfrost. And uh, Greenfrost is uh, the leading e-commerce merchandise specialist uh, with high quality Viking merchandise on, under their own brand. And uh, they built a very successful business uh, since the foundation 2014. Uh, with three uh, amazing entrepreneurs actually located here in, in uh, both Karlstad and very close by to, to uh, Fort Shopping, uh, Shavda. And uh, the idea is to, to, to bring them on board uh, and obviously uh, I see a number of uh, potential synergies within the group. Uh, first of all, the knowledge how to build a, a global merchandise uh, uh, e-commerce business uh, on under one brand, but also the Viking themed 
uh, merchandise are very, very well suited against the uh, Viking theme games uh, within the Embracy group. So uh, please stay tuned uh, for uh, further announcements in the future on that uh, regard. Uh, we are acquiring 70% uh, of the business and the founders remain with 10% each and uh, have a very long term commitment. By this investment, uh, the company will be able to grow uh, even faster and more, uh, have, uh, offering a wider range of products and, and a better supplier of products to consumers. They've already grown uh, substantially the past years, but uh, we're looking forward to grow even further the coming decade. So um, I know they are one of the most respected companies within the Viking uh, merchandise uh, products, and I know that they've been supplying, uh, you know, leading leading uh, TV series and films uh, across the world the past years. So, with that said, uh, I know they are they are online listening here. So, very welcome to the Embracer family. So, with that said about Green Frost. Um, I, uh, I could just say a final, final word that I, I'm really pleased to see uh, all these companies joining. Uh, it's been a lot of hard work during the summer for uh, all of us uh, in this call. And uh, uh, I can't wait to, to see what the future will bring. I think all companies uh, have a strategic rationale why they're joining. And it's all making us, the combine of us, stronger. And uh, as you've been hearing today, it's all about creativity and entrepreneurship. And that's it, uh, Embracer is all about. And uh, I really feel a strong connection with uh, all of you guys. And, and it is uh, uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, I would like to leave over. Please stay online. Uh, it might be a few questions uh, from Ben that I can't answer, and, and you, you might you might be able to answer them during the Q and A session. So Benjamin from uh, Berenberg. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Lars, and to each of the management teams who, who presented uh, today. Uh, just as a reminder, you can um, submit your questions onto uh, the message board and, and I'll be able to pick up some of those. Um, but perhaps jumping straight into to a question from myself, Lars, and before we go into some of the nitty gritty on some of the businesses um, you are acquiring or merging with today, um, you know, we've seen a lot of news in the industry that acquisitions are, are becoming increasingly difficult to, to complete in the video gaming space, given it's very hot right now, Tencent, EA, Microsoft paying big sums for businesses. Um, you've clearly not had that issue. You've managed to do eight acquisitions this morning um, in very different areas of the market too. Can you maybe just give us an update on practically how you've been able to achieve completing all of these deals in such a competitive market? Well, I think uh, that question is somehow better answered, obviously, by the, the sellers and entrepreneurs. But I think uh, to answer it uh, from my side, uh, obviously, Embracer is offering a, a different proposition. Uh, and it's all about the long term alignment with uh, creating something greater and bigger in the future. Uh, and that's why you can see this long term alignment and earnouts over up to eight years. And I think, uh, uh, you know, yes, it's a competitive environment. There is a lot of activity. At the same time, it's a, it's a lot of fantastic uh, entrepreneurs and creators out there. And I think our operating model uh, really uh, has, you know, is a strength here in terms of M&A. Obviously, having eight uh, management teams uh, all across uh, Embracer, most of them working on M&A on a daily basis. It's, you know, it's not all about acquisitions and driving all these financials. It's all about you know, connecting with people. And, and I think in most cases, when you connect with people, you start doing business, you know, publishing business, you, you, you are creating a relationship. That might end up just in a, in, in a, in a relationship or in a publishing relationship or in an M&A. 
So, and I'm super long term, and I think we all are very long term aligned here in, at Embracer. You know, I having decades in my horizon building this. So, for me, it's not it's important not to rush any M and A. And I know some shareholders are a bit impatient and are emailing me, "Why can't you make a, an announcement?" But uh, I'm please asking, uh, you know, all shareholders and and. Uh, to be some have some patience. Uh, it's important that we don't rush and and we're making things uh, patiently and and that we are bringing the right companies on board uh, with quality. So uh, with that said, you know, as I stated this morning, Ben, that we have, you know, I stated that last report, but we have a lot of ongoing conversations all the time. I think more now than ever and including large or even you know transformative conversation whether they will end up in a in acquisition or not uh, remains to be seen but i'm i'm confident about the future of embracer uh, on the m a side but also obviously on the organic side uh, for most okay um uh, that's that's very helpful and um you know one of the areas that clearly with the acquisition of crazy labs this morning that you venture deeper into is the mobile space. And I have to say, looking at some of the KPIs from Crazy Labs, I was particularly uh, impressed, um, which is interesting because there's been nervousness amongst the investor community in the mobile gaming space in the last few months as a result of IDFA and the challenges it could have potentially on customer acquisition. Um, but growth at Crazy Labs doesn't seem to be affected at all. Uh, seemingly by, by this. I'm just interested to hear how they've been able to achieve this when seemingly some of the peers have been struggling. Uh, do, do we still have a team from uh, Israel uh, on board here, Sagi? I think Ben, uh, either Sagi is on board here and answering that question for you, otherwise we need to wait until our public reporting uh, on August 18th. Uh, as you know, we are in a silent period and I don't want to comment on things that are outside these acquisitions. And I think that question is partly is a bit outside uh, Crazy Labs. But just to say, you know, I'm confident about uh, the team, uh, the Crazy Labs business, their growth and their success. Uh, and I'm highly, highly impressed about what they are able to, to achieve. Yeah, well, um, uh, you, you know how analysts are. We're always trying to get as much information as, as I know, possible. Well, I know, I <laughs> know. Uh, but uh, it does seem like a, a great acquisition and one that's uh, that's bucking the trend and, and doing very well. Um, maybe onto the indie space. Um, I think I'm right in thinking that Ghost Ship uh, and Easy Trigger um, are Coffee Stain's first, or at least amongst their first acquisitions. I know Ghost Ship will operate separately, but. Um, with 3D Realms also joining Sega, which will have a strategic focus on publishing of independent developer titles. Also, it seems like you're doing more uh, in, in this space. Is that a strategic push? Was it sort of opportunistic as these good businesses came about and you had started to have discussions with them? Maybe talk to us a little bit about that. I think talking about Coffee Stain, uh, obviously, um has been a great success and an amazing team and, and you're right they haven't been doing a lot of acquisition obviously uh, ghost ship has been one of their key products under the publishing label over the past years and highly successful and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that team joining now as a sister company there is some um, you know substantial amb ambitions in the future you know what we're able to create within that uh, let's call it operating a group uh, with further, you know, successful indie companies. But I think, uh, you know, stay tuned on that uh, part, what will happen in the future. But, um, you know, uh, Gold Ship is, is, uh, is away in the coffee stain, but they are in Denmark. They are very well connected to the Danish or the, the global industry uh, and well respected. So I think it's a strategic value for us to actually being able to fully having a uh, ghost ship uh, within the group. Not only financially, obviously, it helps and, and 
to be clear, financially uh, on ghost ship, it doesn't actually add any revenues because the revenues is already coming on a deep drop right now uh, under the publishing, but it always helps the operation a bit because we're getting the, the full margin. Um, but obviously in the future, they will be able to, to hopefully have more product lines and investments uh, going in under the ghost ship. Um, Anton, are, are you still online here? Perhaps you can just share a bit, you know, why, why, what, what you saw with GoShip and is trigger and, and uh... yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think like I mentioned here, we haven't done a lot of acquisitions, which has been, uh, I guess, kind of natural of how we built Coffee Stain. It's always been about, you know, 100% focus on the products and just not. Uh, not focusing on just growing the company in any way, pretty much. And so at acquisitions has maybe not been a natural part of how, how we wanted to build Coffee Stain. Uh, but I think like when it comes to Ghost Ship, for example, it became very clear for us, you know, early that there were so many similarities. Uh, and I mean, the first time I met Sir and I, I think I was super impressed with their, their thinking being, I mean, they were a new company at that time, but I mean, they are super experienced. They've been in the gaming industry for a long time. And I was so impressed by seeing all their thoughts on how they wanted to run Ghost Ship. Uh, and it was, I think it was very clear already from the beginning that they were, uh, you know, very independent. And when we joined as, as a publisher on, on the title, it was um, uh, also, a, I guess, a special publishing relationship where they, they do a lot themselves. Uh, so when we started discussing, you know, we wanted to uh, to uh, to get them into the group for quite some time, but it was not maybe super clear to them what what the benefit would be. And I think in the end, when we figured out this way where we would set up this structure where they will reside as a as a sister company to us and uh, and operate kind of independently, that opened up that door. And I think it's a, a, a very interesting uh, way forward. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, super happy about that. And like when it comes to Easy Trigger, I think it's more of a natural acquisition for us. We've been working with them, uh, I guess, uh, a little bit even more closely as, as a publisher. And uh, and uh, and they are a small company in Sweden. It makes total sense for us to get them into the into the coffee stain uh, uh, group. So uh, yeah. Thank you, Anton. Maybe just one very quick follow up on that. When you're having those conversations, Anton, and looking to publish um, a title within Coffee Stain, how important is it to see a pathway to potentially sort of acquiring um, the developer, you know, going forwards? Is that important to you um, to, to be able to think that that's a possibility? It hasn't been that important, to be honest, uh, but I think that. I mean, our, our strategy has already from the beginning been a little bit different where we've always been very flexible with how we do our publishing and investments. So in, in the Ghost Ship case, we had the, you know, the 30% 30, 30 that we owned in Ghost Ship from the start. And the, the idea with that at that point was maybe not necessarily to acquire them at some point, but we just wanted to align ourselves um, more tightly with them. Uh, and obviously, if you just go in with only publishing, um, it's, it's a little bit more short term th than what we wanted. So having that, that minority share from the get go uh, made it more clear that it was a long term commitment, but we didn't really know like whether it would end up in an acquisition or not. But uh, I mean, so and it all, you know, everything worked out and then now we're here and uh, that's great, obviously. So. OK, great. Well, um, one of the other um, areas that clearly you've you've bought into um, today, Lars, is uh, is the VR space, and uh, we know that you know Oculus is a big area of focus uh, from from Facebook's. Um, they've been making big hiring into that business unit for them, um, and they're providing big incentives to developers who create content onto that platform. Um, you completed the acquisition of Vertigo last year, and now Force Field today. Um, is this like a strategic push into VR? Um, how do you see this market um, developing um, over the coming years? And, and I guess how much does VR excite you? Um, you know, over the over the next few years. 
Well, obviously, as stated, uh, with the acquisition of Vertigo, uh, we are really excited. Me, you know, first of all, it it really is a commercial viable platform now for developers to build VR products, and uh, Vertigo Pro they could be highly profitable as a business. Uh, uh, and you know, I just see further growth in that market. And as Clement stated, I think that market will grow with a higher pace than the rest of the more traditional gaming market so uh, uh, and I think the plan with Vertigo uh, from the beginning was to to also using or having them as a you know how could we expand their business uh, by allocating further capital or resources to Vertigo so Vertigo becomes kind of a, a even stronger we are company and uh, I'm really pleased to see this morning acquisitions and um, John, uh, John, are you still on the call here? I am. Yeah. Do you believe in the VR market, John? <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. Uh, obviously, um, I, I think the, the the big picture of what we're seeing, um, as I, I hinted at in the comments earlier, um, is a rapidly growing uh, ecosystem, and um, certainly something that. Uh, Vertigo sees, and I believe, you know, as, as Lars has said, Embracer and Kosh Media uh, do as well, that this, this is an area that's going to grow faster uh, than the overall gaming market because what you're seeing uh, is, one, the creation of a new medium and different creative expressions of what gaming can be, and Martin's talked about that a little bit from Force Field. Uh, and then also, we there's this amazing opportunity to bring uh, classic and, and well-known IP from, from other um, gaming mediums into VR and, and allow people to experience these worlds in a way they've, they've never had before. And so we think that also uh, that, that dynamic uh, creates a lot of opportunity for, for growth. I know, I know we said about VR, I know there's a, a number of other VR games under development across the group and there's efforts being, you know, uh, taking against VR. So, you know, we, we, you know, have a long-term commitment against VR. And I know we are working closely with the platforms to support them with content uh, in the coming years. So I'm super excited. And, and is Vertigo, um, you know, in time, if, if you make more acquisitions in, in that space, could it become its own operating segment or will it still remain within um, Project Media Deep Silver? No, it's not, it's not a discussion. I think, you know, it will remain within Coach Media. I, I don't think it makes sense. Uh, I think Coach Media has a very strong ecosystem and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it makes sense to have the synergies uh, with, uh, with that ecosystem with uh, Vertigo. So what I'm hearing, uh, you know, the synergies and cooperation works out very well. And, uh, but with that said, you know, I, I Personally, I love to see more uh, acquisitions or capital allocation and bringing more fantastic creators and entrepreneurs on board Vertigo in the future. But it's really up to John and Arthur, Martin and Richard and Kamara and the team to to do that. You know, it's it's their business and, uh, and they are driving it. Okay. Um, you know, maybe last question for me before I take a couple uh, from uh, from the web. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of companies of, of late who have been um, delaying titles because of challenges with with development. Clearly, a lot of the businesses you have today have got big um, plans for their pipelines over the next uh, few years. Um, when constructing your earnout uh, payments, some of which is financial, some of which I know is operational, um, how important is getting titles out on time for you when creating and structuring those those agreements um, with regard to milestone payments? Yeah, well, there's there's a few milestones. It depends on the agreements that uh, there is a definition of number of titles to be released over a number of years. Obviously, again, it's important for us not to construct these milestones that we push uh, or the companies are pushing releases too early. So I think we have taken uh, as, you know, enough space here to, 
to be aligned on that. Um, and uh, you know, quality comes first. Uh, that's that's important. Uh, what a cross embracer. Yeah, and it's something that's put you in good stead <laughs> uh, in many years in the past. So um, not changing that is is probably the right thing to do. Um, so a couple of questions from from the web here. Uh, one of which is on uh, China. Uh, so there's been a lot of news surrounding stricter rules. Uh, around younger players in China in the past week. I know Embracer hasn't historically had a huge amount of exposure to the Chinese market, but of the acquisitions this morning, do you anticipate these new regulations being an issue for any of the businesses uh, being acquired? No. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> that's 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 very simple. Um, but, you know, we have seen the likes of uh, we had an announcement from Team 17 a few weeks ago when they acquired Story Toys and albeit in a completely different market, one of the reasons why they bought that business was to expand their knowledge of um, sort of regulatory hur hurdles in selling to younger audiences. Is that something that Embracer is concerned about at all, like across the broader business, or is it something that you've feel is in check and it is more noise in the market than anything else? Well, it's a delicate question. You can spend hours answering. Uh, obviously, we do have products for children, not that much in China, I would say, but uh, obviously for the, the Western market, even though our core, I would say, is still, uh, you know, an older audience. Um, but, you know, I'm confident about my management teams, how they, how they, development manage uh, you know these products against these audiences so it's it's not uh, it's not a concern for me uh, and obviously we've done a lot of uh, you know due diligence and so uh, I, I'm sorry Ben I can't really give you any more color on that no that, that's absolutely that's absolutely fine um, and one of the other questions from 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 the web is with regard with regard to sort of first person shooters, uh, with Slipgate and 3D Realms acquisitions this morning, um, you know there's an expansion deeper into into this market, and you already have a lot of presence in that area already. Um, the question is, how much shared learning do you get from bringing more experience and expertise into a specific genre? into the group, given how sort of decentralized the model works? Well, I, I think, you know, just from my own point of view, you, you, you learn things new uh, every day and, you know, you can never get enough learning and context. And I think the sharing of knowledge uh, across Embracer and, and uh, each operating unit just becomes greater every quarter and or every year. So. I'm confident that there is a lot of synergies in that regard, and and let alone the commercial reasons that you know IPs is king and and having more IPs available and resources to develop them. Because again, remember the bottleneck for growth is the talent. That is always to find the talents and the creators, the developers. And, and the business people to bring more products to the market. That's the bottleneck, and that's why we, we are, uh, you know, making all these uh, mergers or acquisitions this morning. Okay, well, um, that's 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 very helpful, and and I think we've run through most of my questions and those on on the web as well. So perhaps the last question I'll, I'll ask you um, is, um, you know, over the next or maybe perhaps longer term few years. Clearly, Embracer's got a significant opportunities, very well respected for being a group that sort of harnesses the opportunities um, of, of the businesses that, that join you. Um, what is it that you're, I guess, most excited about from an acquisition perspective over both with these acquisitions and over the coming years? Um, that will be my last question and then I'll let you wrap up last. <laughs> No, but you know, I, I'm excited about just seeing, uh, you know, all my colleagues and, and the teams, you know, really buy into the model and continue to grow the model. You know, we continue to find and hire more talents, but we also continue bringing more fantastic creators and entrepreneurs on 
to this platform. And I think the greater and in the bigger we get in a way, the greater we become. And, and I think the ecosystems we are building, it's, uh, it's unique in many ways. And I think it will leverage a lot of uh, businesses that we, we get on board. And I think it just makes completely sense for people to join. Uh, because they could see the benefit of becoming part of the group. Obviously, capital we could bring them, but also uh, all the synergies, IPs, distribution, marketing, technologies. And we have seen nothing yet of this coming outward. We have seen a bit, but over the coming decade or decades, I think you will see some amazing uh, things coming out from this ecosystem. So I, I think that's why it makes sense. And that's why that excites me that the greater and, and bigger we become, the, great, the more rationale there is for people to join. And remember, it's not all about owning everything everywhere. It, it just makes sense. And we are an independent platform. We have no ambition to build our own exclusive end consumer platform, for example. We are complementing the industry. We work with our industry partners. We work with the leading platforms. And we would like to continue doing that. They are business partners and friends to us. And we are just 1% roughly of the global gaming market. So I could see plenty of growth the coming years and decades to come. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, uh, Lars, and thank you to all of the management teams who presented. Um, uh, and appreciate that some of my questions were a little bit tricky uh, to, to answer this morning, but I appreciate, um, appreciate you taking the time. No problem. And uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, remember, we have our quarterly report coming up the 18th, uh, August 18. And I'm sure there will be a lot of more questions done from everyone. So thank you.